Welcome to Everyday Entrepreneurs Everywhere with your host, Chris Parker. And welcome back to Everyday Entrepreneurs Everywhere. This is Chris Parker, and I am on with Evan Deporek, who's coming in from the U.S. And we've just discovered that actually I've had one of his family members on for a conversation, and he was introduced to me by Mike Wittenstein, who's also been on the podcast. So it's starting to become this extended family vibe, which I'm loving. So, um, Evan, welcome, welcome to the conversation. Can you can you share with everyone what is it that you do, and why do you do what you do? Well, for, first of all, I've got to share the the uh, excitement I have that you've already had someone I'm related to on here, because with the last name Toporic, we're related. Don't, you don't even have to ask. Don't even have to ask, yeah. Uh, and I'm so overwhelmed. What was your question again? Um, well, yeah, it was funny because you just said, yeah. you know, when we were talking about how to pronounce your name, you, you said Toporic because I would never have heard it before. I said, well, actually, I've had Adam on here. And you're like, <laughs> what? No. So, um, but anyways, we're, this is the yeah. Evan show today. And, and what is it that you do and why do you do what you do? Well, I mean, today what I do is, is new for me. Um, I'm actually advising and investing in, in early stage companies, although most recently I've, I've started working with medium sized companies too. Um, and it's really a way for me to, I guess, give back some of what I've learned and trust me, what I've learned has come from, uh, bumps in the road as much as it has success, but also a way for me to stay in the game. Um, business excites me and maybe it's different than, growing my own uh, business and all of those employees and inventory and everything that came with it. Mm. But it still um, gets my juices flowing. And I'm really excited to start, well, to have been networking and met some of these great entrepreneurs that I'm now getting to work with. And when you mentioned give back, um, that implies you've received or have somehow grown or, or accumulated in, in the alternative apparel story. I, I would love it if you shared just a couple minutes on, on that story and on how you built that out. And, and I, I guess you could call it exited or, or, or sold. Yes. Um, how, what did all that mean to you? Uh, well, let's go way back in time because I, I grew up in Augusta, Georgia. Um, my father was actually in the clothing business, had a camouflage clothing brand sold to outdoor recreationalist hunters. Uh, My grandfather had a factory that sewed fatigues for the U.S. military. So I did grow up knowing about clothing, but never really, that wasn't the reason I got into it. I have an engineering degree from Georgia Tech. um, And my only other job was I worked for a big consulting company, now called Accenture, back then called Anderson Consulting. Mm -hmm. And after about four or five years of doing that, um, I was learning a lot. But what I learned the most was the big corporate bureaucracy bureaucracy wasn't really um, exciting for me. So I needed to find an entrepreneurial path. I had a friend who had started a t-shirt business out of his trunk in college, and he was running that after college um, with his mom and his brother and two other people. And he needed somebody to actually run the business while he focused on um, more of the designer type. And so I bought into his business. He and I uh, were business partners for I mean, almost 20 years. And through that time, we took it as a screen print t-shirt business to a, a, a brand that had our own retail stores. We sold through other stores like Nordstrom, Bloomingdale's. Um, and our largest market was actually selling to people that would print on the shirts and they would be resold at concerts or for uniforms at restaurants and so on and so forth. So all of that being said, I learned a lot along the way. Um, in 2017, we had 150 employees and we're you know, approaching about 100 million sales. So we built a nice business. And um, what more fun than to sell a t-shirt business to basically the inventor of t-shirts. So we did sell it to Haynes. It's a wonderful home for the brand. And after helping transition that for a couple of years, this past January, I um, set out on my own to you know, my next chapter. And I'm, I'm sure we'll, we'll pull some lessons from your the alternative apparel story. But um, if I can paraphrase what I understand, the next chapter is, is well, you're doing venture and a bit of private equity work, but, but 
it's not simply a, a financial transaction. You're really involved yeah. in bringing your expertise in your network. So what is that, you know, how, how did you craft that sort of proposition? So um, we brought on private equity uh, midway through building our company. Um, they invested a non-controlling investment. So they, they acquired less than half of the company. Um, and they did bring a lot to the table. But what I recognized in the industry was extremely smart people driven um, and had some relevant experience, but no one that I've encountered had actually built the business from the ground up. And so I think what's different about my approach in, in investing and advising is I can sit across from a founder um, having faced the exact same obstacles at every stage of their business that they're facing at that time. And I think the experience allows me to give advice that's um, extremely usable. So I'm blending what I've learned through these uh, transactions we've been through, what I've learned in having to um, respect the, the investment that institutional capital has made in, in companies. You need to give them a return on that. On the other hand, I can balance that with understanding protecting the culture and um, making sure that the brand isn't, you know, altered by the fact that you brought in some outside money. So it's, it's a balancing act that will allow me as a private equity or venture investor to see both sides, really. And from my story this year, I've, I've had the, the privilege of working really on, on sort of e-commerce strategy and technology strategy with a, yeah, scaling up fashion brand here in the Netherlands. And I've shared that story with you before. And, and my background coming from utilities and, and financial services, wow, wow, the difference of the world. Um, you know, on, on one hand, the joy of having just tangible stuff, you know, it's just, it's, it's a real thing as opposed to this sort of virtual, you know, philosophical thing like a financial services product. And also margins are completely different. So, so I, yeah. just hats off to, you know, again, my little micro moment in there, but people are making businesses based on art, basically, which is fashion, which is risk. And somehow they're pulling profits and sustainable profits out of such a slim margin because of the competition. Mm -hmm. it's hard it, it's it is hard it's, yeah well i mean if you do get um if you taste success it is a, a nice thing to know that every day you open your doors uh there's some ex expected orders that will flow through mm -hmm. on the other hand you know when you have a business with a long lead time you got to hang in there because you can't really um you, you can't get that success every day it may be every month quarter could be a good deal every six months or a year. So it's, it's a different world and it's highly competitive. Of course, fashion is, and you do have to find something different for us. We were very early in understanding the environmental impact that our industry had the negative environmental impact. And so all along the way, we were really an eco fashion brand. Um, many, if not most have caught up to that now, but we pioneered that. And when you set out with Thread Ventures, mm -hmm. your, your new firm, I guess, or, or um, agency, mm -hmm. uh, it was really to, to look at these, these early, grow, early growth, um, early stage type of, of fashion. Um, I'm just curious, are there two or three typical lessons that, that sort of start up mm -hmm. fashion brands need to get their head around before they can really start scaling and growing because yeah, I, I imagine there's some mindset thing as well as some, some actual hard skill things that, that doesn't come natural to them that, that you can bring to the party. Yeah. And some of it's um, just a, it could be a tough pill to swallow because you've got this uh, utopian hope for how you'll grow your business. But, and by the way, not everything I'm focused on is fashion. I'm helping a real estate company. Mm. Um, I'm looking at e even recycling businesses, but but the one thing I will tell you from a consumer products or fashion brand perspective that's eye-opening is they are likely not capitalized to build brand equity um, with just a vast amount of marketing dollars. And so while I do think that a direct-to-consumer business is ideal and it's the most valuable way uh, when you exit, of course, 
um, to be one-on-one with your customer. That takes a lot of advertising money. Um, and most of the brands I talk to, they're just not yet there. So they have to develop some kind of other way to get there. And it's usually through partnerships or wholesaling, right? But you don't have to have the extensive wholesale relationships we had. You know, you can have a couple key partners, which will allow you to protect that brand, but also use it as fuel to help build your direct to consumer business. So I think the biggest challenge to me facing some of these companies that have great ideas is they may never get that out there um, in a way that enough people see it or hear it if they don't have the capital to market what they're doing. Is that the the fatal flaw then not, not having the capital or is it, or, or can they still sort of take along I and mean, they, it just could be a time thing. It could take longer. They have to be super, um, they have to be very well versed in, in areas like digital advertising for sure. And, and, and how do they convert um, interested parties into actual orders? So the tools are there today. I will say this, when we built our business, we had to invest in complicated and expensive systems. Now I have learned through these SaaS platforms um, that you can get some great marketing automation tools, CRM tools, order management tools, and they're very light. And what I mean by light is e- easy to install and, and not that expensive. And so I think the tools, it's never been easier to open the doors to your business. Mm-hmm. Um, but that means there's just a lot more people doing it. And so how tight can they get their message? How well can they deliver upon it? And then the hard part, I still think, is how many people can they get to see it? Mm. And, and to me, oftentimes, that, that does take some money. You mentioned advertising dollars. Um, and I'm, I guess over the last year or 10 years, the, the, the definition of advertising has shifted. Mm-hmm. Um, in, in previous you know, conversations on other initiatives that we've talked about, the, the, the whole uh, um, you know, affiliate marketing or the, the whole um, influencer marketing um, has evolved. How, how, I'm just curious, how, are you a believer in this whole influence, influencer marketing angle? Um, because for me, in my, my experience, it can be kind of a mixed bag because how, how, does, how does it translate to actual value? Yeah, um, I don't think that the brands I'm helping are to have taken that path successfully. Um, what I've seen is have a product that's your pinnacle product or the product that you're known for, and you can build all of your language, your search, your AdWords, your message. You're mm-hmm. the pants guys. You know, I think... And I know the founder of Bonobos, he did a good job, but they were the pants guys. Tom's you know, shoes were the one for one guys. Those were old examples, but you've seen Away, you've seen Harry's, you've seen all of these product companies. They don't launch as lifestyle brands. I think part of the reason, obviously from a product standpoint, they're experts in one area, but it's also perhaps easier to advertise into a niche. And when you own the mm-hmm. niche, you get the permission from your customers to try other things. Mm-hmm. And so the companies I'm helping that have been successful have a real tight message, a real um, curated product line, something that's digestible. And that way, when they go out and advertise, they don't have to go spread as wide of a, a net on words that are expensive and everyone else wants. They're starting to, to really, um, you know, Throw the right hook in the right part of the pond, yeah. and, and I guess it's it's that balance of of the 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 product um, mm-hmm. focus, yet yet also having some diversity there, um, mm-hmm. addressing that market, you know, being able to hit that that advertising machine, mm-hmm. and then finding a way to scale over time. And another thing I'm finding with with um, just just. I've been stunned recently as, as I've been getting involved in, in the fashion space where the, the commissions that these marketplaces um, can take, it's, it's 40 to 45, 50% yeah. um, commission. So, so basically if you're buying a shirt or a pair of shoes or something at, at uh, I'm not sure what, what are the big marketplaces in, uh, in, in the U S but over here, it's like the Omotas and things like that. Um, there's, there's a huge 
like an incredibly large um, yeah. commission cut. And like, how does this work? Well, I think that maybe that needs to be written off as customer acquisition cost. Mm -hmm. um, and the hope is that they'll come to your site directly, you know, that they'll get to see the whole line and, and the way that you present it in your four walls, mm -hmm. because I agree with you. And I think that's the Amazon effect. You, you, as a consumer, there's nothing better than Amazon. It's so easy to use. They've got everything and it's at your door in two days or less. And from a business to business standpoint, it's a little more complicated than that mm -hmm. um, because of what you mentioned, because of how much they take. Uh, you, you can't ignore the tremendous volume that you can get on a site like that. But to me, it could be customer acquisition cost. It could be you're building your brand name. It's a, it's a, the megaphone is louder when you partner with a site like that. But you, sh you take a company like Nike, and I love what they've executed in the last five years or so. They could be found in every store that you walked in and online as well. And they made it a mantra. I think they were going to try to narrow their wholesale relationships to 40 key accounts. And they put all that extra money in building out how they were going to work directly with their customers. And even for a public company to navigate through that transition must have been tremendously challenging. But in the end, they control the experience and they get the extra margin. So it's what I mentioned earlier is you might need some partners. And I call them partners because I don't love the word wholesale. Your brand yeah. may need, if you have great uh, shampoo, you might need an incredible hotel partner to get your shampoo brand out there. And there's a lot of doors, but that's different than hiring a huge sales force setting up at every trade show, right? And building this entire wholesale platform, which I don't, I think that's the way things used to be done. Not anymore. Yeah, I think there's there's definitely wisdom there. And and you, you shared a bit earlier that it's, you're not only, you know, Thread Ventures is, is not doing, you know, early stage venture capital as well as, as you know, mid scale, mm -hmm. larger ticket uh, PE work. Um, how have you found the whole sort of transition from, because it's a bit opposite for me, because where I've gone really from completely different industry and stepped a little pinky toe into uh, fashion and like, wow. And now you're, you're spreading and, and applying some of this, this, this wisdom and this experience to other markets. How, how have you experienced that? Like, is, is a lot of that translatable or is there it is. really some, I mean, some huge differences there? I don't claim to be a subject matter expert in, in industries where I haven't worked for 22 years, but I do find that the, um, the challenges and opportunities they face do seem similar. To, to those that I did. Now, I'm not consulting with pure tech companies. Um, so I, the companies I'm dealing with still have some uh, old schoolness about them, if you will. But obviously, everybody needs to be tech enabled. So to say I'm not dealing with companies that don't take tech seriously is wrong. Um, but I, I find that most of it is relatable. And then you just need to be a good listener. Don't walk into mm -hmm. the room and act like you know everything about somebody's business or their industry, you need to really sit back with that notepad, take those notes, digest it. And when you don't know the answer, fess up. Don't act like you know something you don't talk about. And to me, these are ultimately end up as partnerships. If you make an investment, you're together and likely for a long time. And I think that trust needs to be built. So transparency is important. I don't understand. Can you slow down? Tell me more. Or it sounds like a lot like what I did is this is how I handled it. They're like, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I think there's, um, <clears throat> at least when I started in the fashion, well, I, I guess, I guess fashion isn't completely foreign to me, but no, nowhere near you. Like worked at Nordstrom as a, as a, as a kid in college that was on the, really on the retail side. Um, so I had, had a bit of a taste there, but when, when I started working this fashion, uh, company here in the Netherlands, literally, you know, after talking to some of the internal management, I just went on the road, meaning went, where are these things sold? Show, show me your own stores, show me your, you know, the re your top retailers, show me, um, you know, the marketplaces online that you're already at, show me the, 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 the back end console of that. Um, you know, what, what analytics are you getting from that marketplace that you don't have for your own internal channels and just started, you know, reflecting and, and refining. And it was, it was so, just a joyous whole journey I'm of glad, discovery. I'm glad to hear you say that. Cause I, and I've told this story before, but when I, 
Um, but I would tell you, I'm naturally more of a finance and operations person. I have an engineering degree. It comes easier to me, but it isn't as fun for me as brand and marketing. So as I started, you know, realizing I needed to become more of an expert in more areas or forget an expert. I need to understand enough about every area. Um, I got on the road a lot more and I'm glad that you just said that. But when I went on the road, it, I never signed up for a corporate hotel program. Never. When I went to the cities, Chicago, New York, LA, Seattle, wherever, I researched where our customers are likely spending their time. What's the neighborhood in that town where an alternative customer would hang out? Hmm. And I found the hotel there. I tell the, the funniest stories. Have you ever stayed at the, the, um, the Ace Hotel in no. New York? It's a very cool hipster hotel. I've probably aged out, but I stayed at the very first Ace Hotel in Seattle, not knowing what I was getting into. And I didn't even have the bathrooms in my room. It was a communal bathroom down the hall. So maybe I went overboard there. But the point is, you did the right thing. If you want to learn more about an industry or your customers, you need to find out how they live, shop their stores, eat their restaurants and stay in their hotels. Today, you can do it online, shop their websites, um, experience their apps, everything else. And I think that um, I appreciate that you said that because it served me well. Uh, me, me as well. And I've, I've done similar things like, um, you know, part of my world is also leadership development. And I was oddly end of February, early March in, in uh, <clears throat> Thailand doing some training for a, a big box store. And uh, on customer experience training and uh, doing some, you know, some loyalty just based on, again, not knowing big box retail, but just bringing in general principles and themes. Um, and I, what I asked for is, is, yeah, I'd like to see some of your stores as well, because I know that I know this brand here in Europe. Um, I don't think that it exists in the U.S., but um, I'd like to see the stores. And, and, and it was lovely that they lined it up because there was this they had their, their digital test store and as well as their big mothership store and. And just to walk there and smell it and then and also ask, you know, some of the staff there and yeah, why is this this way? Right. And, and it just, you know, it, yeah, <clears throat> it was fun because also during that, the, you know, the, the, the regional CEO was with us, which, of course, was changing the people's behavior. So I was, so I was trying to sneak away <laughs> to, <laughs> to yeah. test stuff and open doors and break stuff with, without, you know, the, the boss's boss's boss seeing it. It's, and, and it's um, no, it's a lot of fun. And, and then that gives you all the anecdotes to come back and say, well, why? Why is that the way it is? And maybe there's a reason and maybe they just haven't thought about it. So I'm, I'm curious if, if um, you know, there's people that are, that are listening that are, you know, maybe in fashion or in other, other industries that are, you know, having started a business and they're considering uh, maybe some, some venture involvement. Um, what is the profile of, of a leader, team manager, entrepreneur and, and their company that, sets them up for successful, you know, collaboration with a, a VC or a PE. What does that look like? Cause I think, cause right now, it, you know, I'm a mentor in, in two startup incubators and there's a lot of people that are just so horny for the cash. They're just, yep. they're just, just painting themselves in all sorts of different colors and putting them themselves in different configurations, the unusual body shapes and types to try to attract, you know, right. the coin. Um, right. But the coin is smart and it's not going to, you know, you know, that, that, that you know, they'll see right that's not yeah. that's not the way to get there so i'm curious well, that, what that's okay yeah. i mean not not um there there's a process for every type of exit mm. in our first process we we had a business that required constant reinvestment of our profits so even on mm. paper we were very profitable but we were an inventory based business that had to extend payment terms to all of our customers and so it needed a lot of cash just to operate and we had built a great business over 10 years, but we couldn't really get the money out. Mm. So, but we knew there was a tremendous amount of upside still ahead of us. So that's why we took on a non-controlling investment. We took mm. on a minority investor. It helped us get some of the chips off the table, but it also left fuel in with experts from the outside that could help us go to the next level. And then, you know, when we sold in 2017, it was time. I mean, two of the original partners were no longer active in the business. Mm. And um, it was, it was just time for us to pass the brand on to a, 
a um, majority owner. So there's every scenario is different, but there's certainly a process for, for those that you mentioned that want to sell it for the highest price. And there's others that might feel lonely at the top. Maybe they don't have um, enough strategic thinking with them in the room and they'd like to bring on a partner that can help them think about how to break through that ceiling. And maybe that ceiling's $10 million in sales and they've been bumping up against it. And it requires two or three heads, not one to go through that ceiling. Right. Mm -hmm. Or it could be a, we, we meet with companies that have family transitions. Could be a parent. It's time for the parent to retire mm -hmm. and the child needs uh, equity to buy the parent. Or like I described, it could be a retiring partner. Other partners need it. But in all cases, um, you have to, as the business owner, it's difficult. You, you have to dig down inside and say, what do I want? Do I want to continue in this business and try to get a second bite of the apple? Or is it time for me to try to sell it all? And the buyers vary based on what the seller really wants to do. Yeah, I what I'm really impressed with your stories is you you ran that business for ten years, and so it was it was. It feels like yeah. your intention was to run the business, uh, you know, and, yeah. and then, and then yeah, I mean, I got there. to a point, and you're like, hmm, maybe now yeah. it's time for something, as opposed to seeking the investment from the from the get go. Well, it was twenty two years, and. Um, mm. Like yeah. I, I got there when the business was doing uh, about a million dollars in sales. So they had already gotten it off the ground mm -hmm. and I bought in, I bought in them. Um, but yeah, along the way we needed some, some extra uh, help, some extra fuel. And we did that. And then it worked for us. It, it, it there's what I'm learning now is uh, we had some good fortune and, and we worked hard, but um, there, there's times it doesn't work for companies too. So not every story is a success story. And believe me, along my path, there were many jumping off points, many mm -hmm. too, too long for this episode. And it takes a lot of perseverance and it wears you out and you lose a lot of hair. <laughs> well, let, let's, <laughs> let's jump into that. We've got a couple yeah. minutes left, but um, sure. perseverance and, and, uh, and energy and, and um, yes, yeah, sustaining yourself over, over mm -hmm. that period of time in a, a, a pretty tough you know, it's, it's a hardening uh, market that I've, you know, that I've been, you know, b busy with just, you know, less than a year now. Um, how did you keep it going? Like yourself yeah. as a human? So for me, I don't believe in flat organizations. So I, I had a lot of, um, I, I drew a lot of uh, pride and, um, you know, excitement seeing promotions from within. Now, we did a terrible job of hiring experienced hires from the outside, and I take responsibility from that. There were plenty of people we tried along the way that had great resumes from wonderful brands, and we brought them in, and we didn't integrate them properly. Where we had success was from promoting from within, and so we had very long-standing employees that came from all over the company and, and often into different roles. I, I love telling this story. We had a a temporary um, warehouse worker that she, through a span of four years, became a permanent warehouse worker, customer service rep. And then ultimately, within four years of just being a temp in the warehouse, was our uh, our best salesperson, making the, the highest commission of anyone in the company. So uh, entrepreneurs can spot talent um, in ways that resumes can't always portray. And I loved watching people rise up. And so how did I survive through that? With just a tremendous team of people. And, mm. um, and we, we just, we were blessed to have some great people that worked hard and they were entrepreneurs too, because if they had been with us for a long time, they had chosen to come work at a small, small company. And that alone was maybe a secret ingredient that, that allowed them to not jump off at all those jumping off points mm. too. And what did you mean by, by um, you don't believe in flat organizations? That means you had a hierarchy or, or yeah. some so structure? I don't, how did, I don't you, how did you orchestrate that? I'm not that? one. I, I, don't make, I don't walk around the building breathing on people's, over, you know, I wasn't um, injecting myself into the yes, no process in every square foot of our building. Hmm. So what I mean is impact. We had a pretty cool thing going on. I call it tight, loose, tight. And I, and I got that from an advisor of mine who was on our board. 
I think our people had a really tight understanding of the brand and the strategy of the company and the initiative we were working on. And then we were very loose on how they got their work done. But at the yeah. end, we were extremely tight on the metrics that we would measure the success of that project. So hmm. I think the loose part is what people appreciate. It, they may have different creative ways of going about how they do their work and when they do their work. And boy, have we not learned that this year, right? You don't have to punch the clock at work every day to be great. So that's, I think our style of, do you understand what we're working on? We're going to hold you accountable in the end, but in between, do it your way. Hmm. I think that, that, that helped us out. How did you um, tight, loose, tight? I, I love it. I'm stealing it. Yeah. Um, so, you know, <laughs> building on the shoulders of giants. I appreciate it. I, by uh, the way, I stole it too. I stole it too. Yeah, so. so you're <laughs> passing the baton. Um, the, um, when, you, when you're too loose, so, you know, sometimes people just need help. Meaning, meaning sometimes they're drowning. And, and I, I oftentimes point at leadership because if I have assigned to some, a, a person to a job they can't do, that's my fault, not their fault. Right. Um, that's my own, my own little lens on that. But if you're too loose, you know, how did you keep your pulse enough to know when someone needed either a kick in the ass or a pat on the back? We, we were still a, a company, so we had the weekly check-ins. Um, mm -hmm. But I had plenty of conversations where I had to remind someone to just raise your hand when you need help mm. or if you feel overwhelmed. And nobody's going to, in fact, we're going to think worse of you if you don't. Um, we're going to think more of you if you can admit that because that will allow us to get the work done. Mm. So, um, you know, but we also had our standard check-ins. And we, we, it's funny, we, we, our front office was connected to our warehouse, which was ac actually great because um, mm. you, no one felt uh, any us versus them when you're all working in the same place. Um, and it wasn't that hard to find who you needed to find. That being said, we also had an office in LA and an office in New York. So it does take, you've got to up your communication in ways that make sure you're all on the same page. There's mm. incredible tools that are out there now, <laughs> Slack, um, Teams, Everybody's used to those. We've all really gotten good at that this year, but um, communication is key. Excellent, um, we're, Evan. We're gonna we're gonna wrap up. Yeah. I'm just curious if if there's any last comments or questions you might have uh, for me. You know, stimulated from the conversation, I've really enjoyed it. I'm, I'm sure other people will as well. Blown away that you've had 89 of these. Um, how long have you been doing this? Since yeah, well, yeah, April. Uh, 89 late. since April. Late, wow. late March. And um, how, many, how many like throat lozenges have you gone through? Or is the voice holding, <laughs> voice is holding in there? Voice is holding in there for sure. Um, <laughs> it's, it's no, it, it's been incredible. And, and also just the, the care and openness and, and oftentimes vulnerability of people. Um, yeah. And because I've been very purposeful about, you know, not seeking only, you know, the, you know, whatever the, um, Elon Musk's of the world who are, who are, you know, right. celebrated for what they're doing. You know, great. If Elon, if you want to join, I'll fine. I'll make space for you. But, um, you know, but it's, it's, I'm, you know, there's, yeah. everyone is on a journey and everyone has learned something different than I have. Um, and it's been just a, such a, my own, even an honor and a, and a yeah. gift to have that opportunity to have these conversations and then share them with the technology of a podcast. It's been incredible. Yeah. I mean, the, the only last thing I'd like to share is that I, I don't think there's one definition of success. I met with a company today and, and I was um, I, I was taken back by the transparency of the owner founder who told us he wants to work 20 hours a week. He's a family guy. He, he has this little car he likes to race. He wants to be with his family, watch his young kids grow. That's what he wants <clears> to do. Well, it's better that I learn that now then later, hmm. but it also hasn't somehow affected his ability to, to build a nice business. Yeah. So um, some people define success by their net worth and some people define success by the flexibility their career gives them. What I love about entrepreneurs is you kind of have the option of both, mm -hmm. but um, let's not all fall on the trap thinking that dollar bills are the only measure of success. I think what's great about being an entrepreneur is the fact that you're not really punching a clock every day, but you are controlling your destiny. And in the end, 
if you make good money from that, but you also can enjoy your hobbies, spend time with your family and round out your life, perhaps that's a great measurement as well. So I love that about business too. You can, you can do it your way. And what a beautiful message. And also to, to raise the awareness that you can do it your own way. Um, on, on the thing that, that I've been crafting over the years and, and, and you know, I think you've, you've seen a bit of it is the simplicity scan and, and the whole bottom area of that is called growth. And so many people assume that means financial growth, but it doesn't say anything about financial growth. You know, and it's like, I call it growth or improvement on what is it that you want to improve? What is, what is your, your mission here? And, and, if it, and if it could be growth to a certain point, fine. Like the brand that I'm, fashion brand I'm working with, I'm, I'm really respectful of, of those owners. It's a family owned business and they know where they want to grow and not further than that. You know, so mm. it's still a significant amount of growth, but they have decided not to exceed that. Mm -hmm. you know, at least as an ambition, because that's not the kind of company they want. I think, mm -hmm. wow, that's, that's pretty cool. Uh, <laughs> you know, you know, I like that. Um, and so when, when I work with people with the simplicity scan, I often ask, well, what are you optimizing for? Meaning, you know, you're, you're, you're putting some effort in to think about your business and the next step. What is it that do you want the next step to be? Meaning, do you want more joy or more flexibility or freedom or, mm -hmm. or fun or creativity or, or money or a combination? And, uh, and sometimes that's, you know, that conversation itself can be even more meaningful than whatever the, you know, the specific, uh, you know, consulting piece that you're doing. So it's a, uh, uh, thank you so much for raising that. Here, here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right on. So um, Evan Taporek, thank you so much for joining. And I will put um, your LinkedIn link um, yeah. in the show notes. And so when people find it there, um, really appreciate it. Thank you so much for your time, your insights. And your, and so your, last question, your, have you had more than one Jones? Uh, I've had no Joneses. So, so the Toporics are, are more than keeping up with the Joneses. That's why I think I, I, I think <laughs> I think they are exceeding <laughs> the Joneses. All right, we'll, we'll leave that. on that. <laughs> right. Okay, Evan. All right. Thanks. Thank you, Chris. Take care, man. Bye-bye. Learn more at billion.com slash podcast.